Hello, hello, Blissful Parents. Michelle Abraham, your host here today. And I am bringing you an amazing guest today. Her name is Sue DeCaro. Hey, Sue, how are you doing? Hey, good. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. We're so excited that you are here. Blissful Parents, let me tell you a little bit more about Sue and all the wonderful things that she's all about. First of all, just want you to know that she's got a podcast called Conscious Parents Thriving Kids. So make sure you go and check that out. You can see that podcast on all the major pod, pod, podcasting platforms like iTunes and Spotify and Google. Um, and I would love to share a little bit more about Sue. Sue's a heart-centered coach, educator, motivational speaker, and international best-selling author working with individuals, corporations, and families around the globe to navigate life's daily challenges. And there's many of those these days, isn't there? <laughs> well, yes. Well, integrating education, consciousness, and coaching, Sue helps individuals to feel empowered, grow, and thrive. Her passion is to help people deeply connect, connect with themselves to their children and, of course, the world around them, creating a brighter future. You guys, Sue has been in an awful lot of media on a lot of platforms, speaking on stages with all the parenting experts out there, the big names in the industry. You have got so much credibility, uh, Sue, and it's and it's very inspiring to see. And one of the things I noticed that you actually were a part of the team for MindValley.com too, which was really amazing. And speaking on stages with like Dr. Shafali and so many other notable uh, people and Neil David Walsh, or Neil Donald Walsh, excuse me, and Marianne Williams being one of my favorites. So um, re- amazing all the work that you're up to. And we're so grateful that you're joining us here today. So let's dive in. Today, we really wanted to talk about, you know, self-esteem and kids, the joy factor, and, you know, what's happening with our emotional growth. So Sue, I'd love to just first find out, like, how did you get started in this work? Oh gosh, that is a how many hours? Loaded question, right? (laughs) (laughs) That is a loaded question, but you know I think it's a very important one, and I'm glad that you asked because I I have been accused of having like a white picket fence and my kids all lined up in a row when I blow my whistle. Um, I don't have a whistle; they were never lined up in a row. In fact, just the opposite. And my house was chaotic and and full of unconsciousness way back when. My kids are now in their twenties and young adults, uh, adults. And so I've learned a lot through the years. So the reason I got into this was because of my own pitfalls, my own parenting challenges, my own conditioning for my own family, and just all the things that I was doing, you know, quote unquote wrong. There is no real right and wrong, but they weren't working for me. And they certainly weren't working for my children. And my children were very loud and showing me that. And so Through the years and trials and tribulations, I heard about conscious parenting uh, way back years ago, and I also heard about parent coaching. And I went back to school and got my master's level certification, kind of shifted gears in my career, and really, this is my passion. I know I had a lot of challenges, and I had to look at how I could shift them, and my passion is to help parents all over the world to bring a change to their parenting process to create more joy and connectedness with the children in front of them. Ooh, yes, I love that. And that connectedness, I think, is so important in like all aspects of our life these days, but especially with our kids. What would you say would be something that is apparent when there's there's a lack of connection? Well, a lot of times there's a lack of connection because we're focused on what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. or we're focused on discipline, or we're focused on telling our, you know, barking out orders, child comes home from school, and we immediately get into, you know, did you do your homework? Did you turn in that assignment? Did you get your snack? Did you hang your book bag up? Okay, I've been there. (laughs) And, and we aren't connecting with our child, we aren't open and present to where our child is coming from, how our child stay was, what our child feels like sharing. And this can be a routine where we become focused on what needs to be done and not really open in the space of our child and connecting in a way that serves them. And discipline can really impact how we are connected with our children and how we are disconnected. And by discipline, I mean more manipulation, coercion, you know, uh, punishment and major consequences. Interesting. So when you say connection, what are some examples of like connecting with our kids? That's not those barking orders and those marching orders and all the things that are on our to-do list in our heads. <laughs> right. Put the two to-do list in the very back of your head. And so, for example, when our child first comes home to, from school or 
when we come home and our first interaction with our child occurs, the first 15 minutes can be really powerful in the, in the connectedness, right? We have been apart all day and that's the time to be present with and for your child in their world. Even if you're sitting with them and you know maybe their child that doesn't share or talk too much and you're sitting having a snack, not looking at the mail, not with your smartphone in your hand and not with a computer, but really just there present with them and for them. Oftentimes our kids go off, younger kids, maybe they're playing Legos or something, join them. Join children in their world. Many of the parents I work with have teens, some of them teen boys, and I'm encouraging them to step into the world of playing you know, online games, whatever they look like. And most of the parents are like, what, are you kidding? I said, find out what your child loves about this game. We, we so want to restrict the usage, but we didn't even know what it looks like. And so first learn, what do they like? How does it look? How can I connect? Play with them. They'll be surprised and they will love to teach you something they know. So be present, step into their world and try to put everything else aside so that for a short period of time during every single day, you are there with and for your children. Mm, I love that. I have an example of that this week happened in my household. My son's nine and he went to street hockey, which is an organized little activity that they do at the community school. And um, one night and I said, oh, I'm going to come play adults and kids play. I'm like, oh, I'm going to come play street hockey too. And he's like, what? He's like, he was surprised. He's like, you are? And then he was like, yeah, you should come play. That would be so fun. I was like, I said it jokingly, but I was like, oh, okay. We, I thought maybe he'd be embarrassed to have me there, but he was actually like super excited about it. I was like, okay, well, that's cool. I can do that. <laughs> and that would be a great place for us to connect. So that's cool. Sure. For sure. And you're invited now. Take advantage of it because, you know, well, then maybe that's when the embarrassment might kick in. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I think I've got a few more years. That's a great example. I really, um, yeah, it was really uh, something that I I thought that, well, wow, that's like really great that he's really um, open to that. And something um, another one of our experts said here um, a few episodes ago that really struck me as interesting in that connection piece is that especially for a boy um, to not say anything like when he comes in the car other than like hi and let him to be be quiet so he talks and holy smokes I tried that a little while ago and he wouldn't stop talking the whole car ride home was about 20 minutes I was floored because I learned so much (laughs) more than I would have had I been the one talking Right, right. And same thing with their friends, Michelle, when their Mm -hmm. friends are in the car, you know, oftentimes as parents, we want to ask the friends questions. If we just sit silently, we can learn all sorts of things about their social world, what they like, what's happening, the girls, the boys, you know, like who's doing what with whom. And, and so, you know, it's a real eye opener. And this is something actually with the parent I had earlier today that we were talking about, because when their child gets in the car, she wants to know about the day. Mm-hmm. Right. We want to know about the day. What did you do? How did you do it? What it looked like? Same thing that, you know, when they come home and oftentimes our kids get in the car and they're on their cell phones. Mm-hmm. And I encourage parents to think about your child's day. They've been in school for seven, eight hours a day and they've been sitting and behaving depending on how old they are. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's tough. They're sitting still, even in their teens, you know, mm-hmm. sitting and paying attention and learning all day long is hard. When they get in the car, this is their time to connect with their friends, because oftentimes our kids don't see their friends throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So some parents really take offense to a child starting to use their phone as soon as they get in the car and not connect with them. And I, I encourage you to give your child space to connect with the friends they have not really talked to or seen all day long and come around to you when it's there, when they feel ready. Don't force this connection because you're going to get one word answers because they're not there. They're not in the space. They don't want to talk. They want to text. Mm, I love that. Yeah. I sometimes get the best uh, conversations going right before the, it's like the pillow talk, right? Right Right. before they're going to sleep. Like, gosh, we should come up here a little bit earlier every night. This is good stuff, right? (laughs) Right. Bedtime is, is so valuable for connections because our kids don't have a wall up. They're tired and they share and say things that you might not expect at, at that time. And again, just being present and you know, fully uh, supportive and listening and hearing what they have to say can really help the dialogue and the conversation and the connection to yeah. blossom. 
That's we don't have to thing. fix it, change it, solve it. We just have to listen. Right. And it's interesting now as a parent, my mom said to me, um, yeah, I used to, uh, like she was, they were always driving us everywhere. And I was like, well, that's so nice of them to always volunteer. Like there was, that was a lot for them to drive us everywhere. She's like, are you kidding me? She was like, that was the best. I got to learn all the stuff that was happening in your guys' lives because I was in the car listening to you guys talk with your friends <laughs> as we were going to the movies or to bowling or wherever. <laughs> and she said that was like her best, like, you know, best way to connect with us is to get to learn all of, all of what's going on. So just like what you said, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, great way. Yeah. That's very cool. I wonder, um, you know, what's happening these days and you're, you know, just before we press record where I was trying, I was asking you a little bit about like, what are some things that you're seeing a lot of parents, you know, concerned about, or what's coming up in conversations for you and your, in your business and um, the word joy came up. So what's happening with joy. I feel like there's, I feel this in our community that there's just a little bit of a lack of joy and I'm not hundred percent sure why or how we can get back to it, but what's the experience been for you as a, as a coach in your business? Yeah, sure. I think joy is, um, joy in parenting. Let's talk about that, you know, yeah. because joy in life may be different from joy in parenting, but mm-hmm. parenting has been, let's face it, the last couple of years, even harder than it normally is. Um, and parents have been faced with so many things with the pandemic and, you know, how to structure, how to change, how to work from home, how to have your kids home. And so you're together all the time. We can lose joy in that. But I think parenting as a whole has so much stress attached to do it right. Mm. Whatever that is, you know, I don't like that word right and wrong because yeah. there isn't any right and much wrong. Pressure. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure. Those words are horrible. It's, it's, you know, it's not one or the other. It's getting to know your child, the child in front of you or your children, and they're all unique beings. So you have to get to know each one of them and what helps each child to grow and thrive and bring joy to that child in that child's own way. It's not your joy for your child, it's your joy for you. Your child's joy is personal, it's unique onto them. So, you know, oftentimes we lose sight when we're raising children of, how to create a, the environment for that particular child to thrive. And we're trying to push the child where we want the child to go. There's no joy in that. There's no joy in that for us or for our children. So, you know, for example, before I had kids, I thought I knew it all. I thought it was, you know, the best parent in the world, but I didn't have any children to raise, but I knew everybody else was doing it wrong at that time. Um, And I would go to a restaurant where kids would, you know, get up and run around. And I think my kids will never do this. (laughs) And, you know, get on an airplane where kids would be crying and be like, why can't these parents control their babies? Like, Mm -hmm. what is going on here? Okay, so I was the expert and then I had a child and I was like, holy cow, what's going on here? (laughs) And And, you know, I I felt like before I had kids, I could control the situation Mm -hmm. and control everything in reference to a child, my children, what they did, how they did it. And we cannot. And I think part of joy is letting go of the illusion that we have control, because quite honestly, we don't have control over any human being, any other human being in our life. Mm -hmm. We really don't. When the baby is, you know, being changed and lays in, you know, the crib and, and eats and sleeps and, you know, we change the diaper, that's it. As soon as they start moving, there goes the control out the window. So when we are able to accept this notion of control as an illusion, I think we can bring more joy to our parenting and more peace to our, you know, our family life. And isn't that what we all want? Some peace and harmony. I know I did, and I had just the opposite, chaos and confusion. So to bring more peace is to let go of some of these really harsh ways we've been conditioned, in my opinion, they're harsh, to believe that we can be parents, Mm -hmm. perhaps from generational patterns. And again, no offense to the previous generations, they did the best they could. Mm -hmm. But we know more now, and we know control is not really happening. It's just a, you know, something in our imagination that we think we have and we really don't. And so the more we try to push control and force control, the more we disconnect from our children Mm -hmm. and the more we create frustration, anger, you know, and lack of joy and lack of joy. I think part of connection and understanding and seeing the child in front of us can bring joy because we're honoring who that child is. 
And in order to honor who that child is, we have to see them, we have to hear them, and we have to value them as human beings on this planet. And when they feel valued and heard and seen as they are, they feel worthy, right? We all do. And when we all feel worthy, we're more connected, right? As a family, as a family unit, as individuals. And joy, I think, comes from that as well. Mm. Powerful, yeah. And would you also say that, you know, parents taking some time for their self-care too can also really impact that? Huge, huge, yeah. I think, you know, this is a a misnomer that, you know, self-care is selfish. And so when I, when I start working with families, that's the first time I did that. (laughs) I don't don't know, but I mean, when I, when I was a young parent, I was like, you know, oh my gosh, I got to get out of here. But I felt so guilty if I left, you know, gosh, my children would think I'm running away. So, you know, I think this is one of my big focuses of a few big things when I work with families. One is self-care is a must. It must be on top of your list. Mm-hmm. And you must take care of yourself first to re-energize every day if you can, as much as you can. Even a five-minute mindful shower where you're really paying attention to where you are, not running through a whole gamut of what your day looks like that you have to get done and all the stress associated, but being present with and for yourself in that moment mm-hmm. can be self-care. So it doesn't have to be you know, these elaborate things. I have to go pay for a gym membership and show up every day in my beautiful gym clothes. No. <laughs> It has to be something that serves you in whatever brings that energy to your body and to your soul. And if we don't take good care of ourselves, we can't expect ourselves to be patient, understanding, not angry, not frustrated, not trying to control things because we don't have the energy to do what we need to do in a different way. And so we're reactive Mm -hmm. as opposed to responsive and connected. So if you see your parenting practices, you know, kind of running on empty, or you see you're really trying to force control, or you find yourself day in and day out frustrated, or just one day, reflect, not to beat yourself up, because that's one of my second things, we're not allowed to beat ourselves up. What did I do today that took care of me? Because like a car, your car does not take your kids to their activities on empty. Okay. Neither do you. I don't like the. I don't like to fly, so I don't like the whole oxygen because right. I don't really want to see those things dropping down. Right. No, you never <laughs> want to have to actually do those things. <laughs> right, right. So I never use that as an example. But the car, you know, we're in our car all the time, mm-hmm. taking our kids where they need to go, and you can't take them when it has no gas in it. And you need to energize yourself too, so that you can have the energy to take them where they need to go. And I'm talking about in the home, you know, just being present as a parent taking them where they need to go, not yeah. physical. So as a question to that, so for parents that may be working and then they have kids activities and dinner and then they get to the bedtime and it's like, that's where their patience is short. Would you recommend that they find some time for that self-care between like work and coming home? Or is it okay just to do it in the morning? Will that last throughout the day then? You know, it's unique for each one of us and what, what serves us. Um, you know, I work with some parents where we do like a mini meditation mid afternoon to, you know, early evening or right after dinner because they are spent, you know, their whole day is caught up with them. So for some of us, it may last and for others, not so much. So I think find what serves you. If you can sneak away before bedtime for five minutes and, and meditate, listen to music, dance, take a shower, take a bath, you know, light some candles. Like, again, I could go on forever. Complicated things. Yeah. (laughs) Uncomplicated things. Remember, it's not, it's not the, the magnitude of it. It's what serves you. If you feel good lighting a candle, which I light a candle every single night at dinner, every night Mm -hmm. without fail, that serves me. I can't say why it just does. And these are the things that bring us the energy that we need to get to the next step. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling with your child's bedtime because your child doesn't easily fall asleep, then maybe you need to revamp the bedtime routine. Start a little earlier. You know, some of our kids don't go to bed so easily or they want more of us. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at why does our child want more of us? Is it because they don't feel connected and this is the connection time? Oftentimes we look at bedtime as, you know, our child should just go to bed and go to bed quickly and then we can get on with it, right? Because we need some time for ourselves. 
but look at bedtime as an opportunity for your child to connect with you. And if they're behaving in a way that doesn't serve you or feels uncomfortable, what is it about that that you can bring attention to? You know, even if it's, can you stay five more minutes? Mm -hmm. If we stay five more minutes, we have less power struggles mm -hmm. than if we try to put our foot down and get out, right? I remember bedtime. So I, I can feel it in my heart, you know, I'd shorten the song so I could go and, you know, sit on the couch because I was exhausted. Right. Yeah. And right yeah. Place, you know, we're right. all exhausted. Being exhausted for sure. But also like, I, I, you know, as my kids are getting older now, like they're nine and six and I'm like, those bedtime, like time is like so valuable, so precious now that they're, you know, I'm like, when are they going to stop wanting me to like lie down and hang out with them for a little bit? So it's like, kind of want to hang on to those times. I, I like them just as much as they do, I think. <laughs> yeah. And I like what you said, you can lay down with them. So, you know, my daughter was, I want to say 15 or 16, she's now 24. And she'd probably kill me if she heard me sharing the story, but that's okay. probably, <laughs> we won't <I'm>, tell her. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Yeah. We've talked about it, but she used to ask me to put her to bed at 15 mm -hmm. and sing a song and rub her back. And I can remember at that time making excuses because I thought, oh, you're 15. I maybe too old for this. Right. Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, it was an age and stage of development, which a lot of us parents have that we think our child should have reached a milestone by that time and just go to sleep. Yeah. And the more I actually started to focus on what is this about? Oh, she wants to connect with me. Oh my gosh. In two years or three years, she'll be off at college and I won't have this time. Mm -hmm. I was able to, you know, let go of that age and stage of development yeah. and engage with how lucky I am that I can still lay with my daughter and sing, you know, with my terrible voice and not be judged and, you know, and really have that connected time mm -hmm. that yeah. isn't everlasting. Yeah. So I agree with you, you know, take it while you can. Yeah. It is a beautiful gift and, you know, they don't stay young forever. No, they certainly don't. Um, so for those of our parents that are maybe wondering, um, what is a conscious parent? Great question. So I, the simplest way I can describe it is it's twofold. A conscious parent is one that looks at the, their own baggage mm -hmm. that they're bringing to parenting. So for example, our conditioning from our childhood, how we mm -hmm. learn to be parents, which mm -hmm. is not you know, a book we were given, it's literally how you were raised. That's what you take oftentimes into parenting unless you unpack it. And it's a cycle too, because it's generational patterns that are handed down from you know, grandparents and great grandparents to your parents and then to you. So it's really looking at the backpack of your childhood. It's also looking at society. Society pressures us. We see all sorts of things on social media, TV about what families should look like. Mm -hmm. And the word should, no, should not exist in our vocabulary. <laughs> as Don't I just shit used on before. yourself. <laughs> Don't shit on yourself. So we have to unpack our conditioning you know, from society as well and also all the outside noise, okay? The neighbors, what everyone else is doing, the milestones, this child, you know, this child's crawling before my child, all of those things. Yeah, that so comparison. that's craziness. <laughs> yeah, that's one piece because your child's unique. Mm -hmm. So we have to unpack that. And it takes a lot. Uh, believe me, I've been there unpacking and unpacking and it was a big bag. <laughs> I carried a big bag around. Um, the second piece of this and it sounds easier than it is, of course, it takes work, is to see your child or your children, each one unique beings here on this earth to teach you just as much as you're teaching them. So our children are reflections. Many parents say, you know, my kids aren't listening. How are you listening to your kids? My kids aren't doing what I say. How are you modeling for your children? Mm -hmm. Right? So they reflect back to us where we need to grow, where we need to bring attention. What's, like I said, with bedtime, if your child doesn't go to bed easily, look at what that looks like for the two of you and maybe what your child needs because what they're reflecting back to you is I need something more than you're giving me. So our children are here to teach us beautifully if mm -hmm. we allow them just as much as we're here to teach them. And we have to create the conditions for each child. I mean, my kids could not be more different as everyone's children. And each one of my kids, I have two, needed me to parent them in a little bit of a different way, which I didn't know until they were in their teens. So really look at the child in front of you. What does that child need? How is that child thriving? 
and what will serve that child. And that's the two part quick answer of conscious parenting. Yeah, I love that. And it's like, instead of looking at like, how do you be as a parent? It's like, how do you be to a parent to this particular child versus this particular child? It's something that I didn't really notice until not that long ago. And I was like, yeah, I really need to be different with this one than I do this one. (laughs) They don't respond the same way. They don't, you know, they need different things. Um, and they're very wired, <laughs> wired very differently. <laughs> so I think that's a really most children uh, are Michelle as most yeah. children are. I mean, there's very few kids that are alike, you know? Yeah. And like you, before having kids, I was working in, um, after school care and preschools and things like that going, if I keep working here, I'm not going to have my own kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> oh my God. <Child> overload. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it was a bit crazy, <laughs> but I'm so glad I did have kids and it's so fascinating watching them grow through the different stages and I think the first thing for what I've noticed as a parent, just be aware, um, aware of it. And, and how can we so understand if they're thriving versus not thriving? Uh, what are some indicators that they are doing really well and they're just thriving fine? I think you behavior. Worry about that, right? Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think as part of conscious parenting, behavior is a form of communication. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you're seeing your child work with you, you know, because I don't like to look at behavior as good and bad, right? right? It's behavior, period. So when your child is having a positive day, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they may be thriving in that day. When they are not doing well in school or at home, or you see their, their um, you know, their behavior, I'm trying to think of the appropriate word to use here, you know, I want to say going south, quote, unquote, you know, Uh, and not what you feel is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Look behind the behavior. I think behavior is probably the one indicator of how our children are doing. So, you know, for example, uh, my granddaughter, who's seven, has been through a lot of things in her little life. And she had a couple of days this past week that did not go well in school. And she got little reports. And my daughter said, you know, help, what do I do? You know, I don't know where to go with this. Like she's doing this and doing that. Well, you know, have you, it's like parent to come consult. And with, right? I'm going to get a big bill. And she said, no, I'm on, this is a trial. <laughs> just anyway, <testing> answers. <laughs> I'm just testing, see if your stuff works. So, you know, we talked a little bit about it and she tried to have a conversation and my grand, my granddaughter was like, I don't know, I don't know, you know, kind of, what were you feeling today? Why did you have a tough time? So I had a Zoom call with her. And uh, it was the hardest client I've ever had, (laughs) seven-year-old. But, um, you know, just trying to get to the bottom of what was going on, you know, and I said, did you have a hard day? And she said, yes. And I said, tell me a little more about it. And she, you know, she, I had to be super creative and that's, you know, that's the thing for parents. We have to be very creative because they can communicate, but they may not want to. And, you know, if they're crawling under desks at school or at home, or if they're, you know, kicking everybody under the table at dinner because they're frustrated, Mm -hmm. something is causing that frustration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of helping our children to thrive is looking beneath the behavior. And Kelly Bartlett has a great um, uh, meme or poster. Mm -hmm. It's called the iceberg. Um, so if anyone would like to see, you know, the iceberg and, and kind of what's beneath the behavior in our children, because 90% of what is being communicated by their behavior is beneath the surface is at the core or somewhere, you know, below what you can see. They open the fridge, they get a snack. You see they're hungry. That's the 10%. Mm. They throw the food because, well, that may be something underneath. Right. (laughs) A lot of things that are underneath. That's interesting. Yeah. So take a look at that parents, the iceberg. And so if you look it up on Google, I'm sure. Absolutely. Kelly Bartlett. Yep. Kelly Bartlett. I I love her and I love the iceberg. It's, it it comes in most of my conversations. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Uh, Well, Sue, I have enjoyed so much learning all about conscious parenting and helping kids thrive and the joy factor and all the great things that we've discussed today. I know you have a free gift for our parents too. Where can they find out more information about working with you? Sure. Um, So my free gift, excuse me, is an ebook on conscious parenting. Just give you some tips and ideas of how you can be more conscious in your parenting approach. 
Um, you can find out more about me on my website, which is my name, www.suedecaro.com. You can find me on Facebook, Sue DeCaro, and on Instagram, Sue DeCaro. There's a theme here. And <laughs> I love it. <laughs> of course, Conscious Parents Thriving Kids is not only my podcast, but also it is a private Facebook community for parents if you are looking for daily support. Right. That's fantastic. And so we will put that all in our show notes for you guys, also awesome. parents out there. And uh, Sue, I just want to thank you so much for being with us here today. And if there's any last words you can leave our parents with today, what would those be? You know, I think uh, be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Every moment is a new moment. And so the moment the past is gone, learn from it, move forward and don't harp on it. So, you know, we can be our harshest critics. Mm -hmm. We need to be our best ally. So be gentle with yourself. Be nice to yourself. <laughs> Thank you for that advice. That's so helpful. And blissful parents, go out there and have a fabulous week. Be gentle to yourself, <laughs> as Sue says. And thank you again, Sue, for joining us today on Thanks, Blissful Michelle. Parenting. We'll see you again next week, parents. Thanks again.